Welcome to another edition of Politics and Rent. My name is Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we are honored to have once again, Patrick Lavelle. Patrick Lavelle is a producer, director, and much more. I like to call him the protagonist of the con, which really explained the, more than the mortgage crisis, but much of the crisis in our financial system. Today is here an extended talk about not only the Trump indictment, but what that means to the our entire financial system and some of the the and some of the issues with with the actual uh, charges against him. So, first of all, welcome aboard, uh, Patrick. How are you doing today? Wonderful. It's great to see you as always, Egberto. Now, Patrick, you are, while everybody's hyperventilating about these charges against Donald Trump, I think much of uh, what you are saying and in some of the work that I've seen you do on, on the internet is that, yes, these are charges, but whatever happened to how they, they actually integrate or play a part in the bigger financial picture of the country? Why don't you elaborate on that? Absolutely. But I think what I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind me, re, re, uh, like it's not uh, a methodology of tennis, but I am very curious to get some orientation in terms of you're the hardest working uh, producer that I've seen in independent media. And so you're seeing so much that you're reflecting and you're refracting from your audience and people that you interview. And obviously, Donald Trump's a big part of that. Can you give me an idea, Egberto, even though I watch much of your stuff, but if you were to prioritize, for example, what the position of all of these some total investigations and indictments of Donald Trump say to you within the context of what's important for you and your viewers, how would you set that table? The interesting thing about it is when I look at the Donald Trump issue, as far as how it affects me as a person, now that he's not president, now that he's not in power, it means very little to me on a personal level. However, however, as I pointed out before with uh, what I hope you're going to talk about as well, is that there are so many other things that are happening economically, financially in this country that our hyperventilation on Donald Trump will have us, uh, would have us discount, disregard a lot of what's occurring that, that actually means more to our financial well-being, to the country's financial well-being altogether. So that is where I put it. I don't know if that, that's what you're asking, but in effect, I am saying that it is great. We want to see Donald Trump put away for being the crook that he is. Donald Trump put away for being the evil that he represents. But he is just one person, and the evil that we talk about, the financial evil itself, is systemic. And unless we capture that, uh, feeling good about throwing Donald Trump in jail solves very little of our problem. Wow, that was very powerful, uh, Egberto. And I really appreciate you uh, you know, basically teeing off with that because um, the, 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 the position that our media continues to perpetuate um, is this notion that we have sort of a code five, um, you know, uh, alert, um, a sort of desperate scenario that our dem democracy is at stake, that um, we are in a uh, pre predicament to where everything that this country supposedly stands for, and when we say democracy, I would I would think that most of us would consider that the rule of law uh, and the accountability, or I should say, uh, the ability of the rule of law to hold power to account was exactly what our founders had designed this country to accomplish. Of course, the architecture is separation of powers and you know what uh, the administrative branch does vis-a-vis -vis and versus or however uh, you know specific situations work out with the judiciary and also um, obviously through uh, Congress is, is this sort of modus operandi of balance for the American people. Presumably the country itself is guided to be of, by, and for the people. Of course, famously, Abraham Lincoln said at the Gettysburg Address, the nation of, by, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. And that was given, of course, during the Civil War. What was the issues of the Civil War? Well, the Confederacy and um, you know a, um, uh, a conflict of power and the resolution that there were two different sorts of ideologies, one based on um, ownership of human beings and the other presumably, of the ideals of the founding. 
that all men are created equal. Okay. Loosely, that's kind of how I think most of us set the table in our mind uh, as we approach this sort of, shall we say, 24-7 onslaught of information um, as it relates to um, all things Trump and him running for the presidency and whether or not um, this is indeed the end of democracy if, if somehow Donald Trump beats the rap. From where I'm coming, Egberto, we don't have a democracy. <laughs> we haven't had a democracy for a long time. Um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, very important uh, studies and revelations. I mean, I think I go back to uh, you know the uh, the uh, economist Thomas Piketty a number of years back when he revealed that basically, you know, the parameters and 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 the sort of tax policies and the nature of being able to pass inheritance and land ownership and all of those sorts of things have impacted um, our political manifestations so that we don't have a democracy of by the for the people. And let, let me let me let me let me ask you to hold right there for one particular second because I am glad that you're taking it to we don't have a democracy, but you're framing it that because of the way capital moves around, it inherently pre uh, prevents. Uh, the true demo uh, the execution of true democracy for everybody. But I just want to make people aware that it's not only the financial doings that affect that we don't have a true democracy. I want folks to remember that from the inception of this country, when we talk about two senators per state, irrespective of the number of people in that state, that is not democratic. When we talk about a, a Supreme Court that has the ability to overrule laws created by the legislature and signed by the president, and nine people currently have the ability to overturn that, and without a two-thirds majority in the Senate, that they, they, in effect, put that law out of existence, that's not a democracy. When we have gerrymandering in different states that allow a state like Ohio to send a supermajority or close to of representatives to represent Ohio in the Congress, even though Ohio, when it comes to the amount of people in the state, or rather the people in the state, is a close to a 50-50 state, given watch how they have two senators, one from each party, that proves we're not a democracy. And what Patrick is talking about now is even bigger because it, that one, is not easily seen. All those things that I just mentioned within the political structure, anybody can understand it. What Patrick is going to, what Patrick is talking about with the economy and the undemocracy within the economy, that you have to do another level of thinking. Continue, my friend. Well, absolutely, and I really appreciate you. Um, you know, again, setting the stage appropriately with that analysis because, you know, in addition to that, you know, of course. Uh, many of our uh, our friends in this country will always like to point out, well, we were never um, designed as a democracy. We're designed as a, rep a representation, uh, excuse me, a, represent a representative uh, republic. Yeah. Based on constitutionality of the whole thing. And, you know, what that is, is, is to me, it, once you understand how this whole thing works, especially over the course of decades of policy and that sort of thing, you, especially when it comes to gerrymandering, probably above all uh, for me. But um, you get into this notion of, oh, wait a second, what you guys are talking about is um, uh, a, a government for the minority, those that are the most well-placed that can manipulate the most and be able to create the sort of inverse perverse of what we all think is uh, or buy into or taught from the very beginning in most of our culture, particularly in popular culture, uh, reinforces these sorts of um, uh, misunderstandings is this nature of, well, OK, anything is possible in this country because we've set the table of fairness that enables me as an individual the dynamic opportunities to evolve to where I want to go, that I'm in um, a sort of control of my own destiny, that I will find a place in society that I can engineer and architect for myself. And therefore, the country, because of the scaffolding of the laws and the regulations and the nature of how things work, um, you know, will be able to afford me those opportunities. So I buy in because therefore it's liberty and justice for all. Therefore, it is a government of by and for the people, which, of course, you just demonstrated um, isn't. And it has been a problem from the very beginning. 
But we have also had, if we're doing a historical analysis, everything from the uh, initial um, revolutionaries where there were um, a a large percentage of abolitionists who uh, did not want to see slavery in the United States from the very beginning, but they compromised. And then we moved on forward. And of course, we had everything from the Civil War to the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment. And then, of course, the progressive movements of everything that catalyzed from you know women's suffrage to civil rights to environmental Unions. movements all of those things and the labor movements happened prior to Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> which then manifested all the way through economic upheaval and turmoil and war and everything else to eventually um the Frank the FDR administration and the clean new deal so none of us i think should ever have an expectation that anybody throughout history has ever got it perfect and we all know that human beings are flawed But there is a big, big, big difference between the uh, sort of, shall we say, um, perception at the moment, particularly those of us who are, shall we say, status quo Democrats, if that happens to be the case, that the one impediment to the uh, short, shall we say, the functionality of United States democracy is this clown, Donald Trump, a guy who you'd have to be absolutely blind not to see over the course of literally decades, and it wouldn't take a lot of research for you to understand all of the ways that Donald Trump has been operating, quite frankly, in a racketeering enterprise for literally decades. So it was very interesting to me, for example, that mainstream media literally almost had a volcanic explosion. When this past week, we saw 13 indictments in um, uh, in Georgia, Kara Fawny Willis, the DA, who brought, among other things, a sort of grand gesture of what we call RICO, the racketeering uh, statutes, that now media can say, without hedging themselves, they can say declaratively, well, we thought that it was possible that Donald Trump was a criminal enterprise, and of course he acted criminally within the context of the insurrection, so therefore... Now we have a sort of foundational understanding that we can further this notion that the biggest impediment, the biggest challenge, the biggest thing that we have to overcome is Donald Trump and, of course, his following that we all commonly refer to as MAGA. Now, they're significant and they're getting more, shall we say, um, audacious and aggressive. But it's almost audacious. The whole thing is audacity. And I learned this from, you know, white collar criminology in all of the work that we put into, you know, what brought us together, our platform mm-hmm. called The Con, which incidentally, and for your viewers, I would I'd recommend you uh, check out our website because it's now for free. And you can find this information at www.thecon.tv. But it puts me in a very uh, interesting position, uh, Egberto. Because when we decided to uh, try to answer some incredible head-scratching questions following the 2008 great financial crisis, to me as a filmmaker, to me as a producer, to me as someone who had actually lived through that scenario, nothing in media to me actually made sense. Because we were in this process where the government was transitioning from the Bush administration after the second administration and everything that came through the the, the sort of uh, the time period of 9-11 through, of course, um, everything that created the 2008 Fresh, yeah. financial yeah. crisis. But uh, ultimately, you know, the front runners at that time were Senator John McCain, of course, and of course, <laughs> his uh, running candidate, Sarah Palin, and everything that that, uh, <laughs> um, you know, emulated at the time. But also, of course, um, you know, President Barack Obama, one of the most um, gifted and brilliant orators and a guy that just seemed to be to people like myself, I think, the right guy at the right time um, to save the country who was writing a populist um, sort of mandate um, based on the premise, which I fully didn't understand at the time, but I always thought was a little bit um, of a platitude, if you will. But, you know, this is what uh, politicians do. But do you remember the whole campaign slogan was change we can believe in? Change we can believe in. Yes, we can, as well as you are the change that you were waiting for. Absolutely. And, platitudes and really platitudes that could have meaning. Yes. Right. And they, they were all very uplifting and beautiful. And here is, a, you know, this 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 wonderful guy, you know, 
educated to the level it seemed to be the best of the spirit of Americana as far as I'm concerned like for me you know what I celebrate above all else and what you know if I were to put my cap on and I were to design it and I would make it in America by the way not in China um I would say um you know what makes America great is the dynamism of the opportunity predicated on the structural format of law that enables people to um you know uh thrive in a system and, and get as far as they're capable of but at the same time, I believe that you always have to have an opportunity of a safety net because life can be tumultuous. And I understand capital flows and I understand economic uh, turmoil, been around for quite a while. But 2008 was something special. It was something different. It was something more calamitous. But yet, once again, the American people found a way to devise a scenario to where the angels of our better nature seem to be pressing forward to solve the problems of that particular time period. Well, as it turns out, that didn't happen. That didn't even... I tell you what, before, when, when we talk about that didn't happen, let, let, let's point out one thing. It, uh, and we, we should have seen from the time that Obama got elected that it wasn't going to happen when one of the first thing that, that got done was this, the quasi-disbandment of OFA, which had turned into a powerful organization that could really meet the people. In other words, OFA or Organizing for Obama was a powerful uh, uh, grassroots organization that could really reach the people. As soon as that occurred, it's one thing that we should have known. We were about to head slowly back into a status quo. But continue, please. Well, but to your point about status quo, and this was, for me, something that I didn't understand until many, many years later. But as it turned out, uh, Barack Obama put into his cabinet pretty much all of the same people, yes. the titans of this, this fusion that the Clintons had created between our financial structure and the Democratic Party at that time, and of course, which many of us regard as the sort of the primer, the central, the the DNC, that sort of thing. Um, but it was it was the revolving door of the meritocracy, the professionals, if you will. And uh, but what he he put at the highest levels of his administration, his cabinet, were the same people that created the crash. Right. So change we be, we could believe in turned into. Guys, don't listen to what I'm telling you. Don't look behind the curtain. I'm going to tell you what you want to hear, but I'm going to serve the financial system. And I'm sorry if that's a little bit disconcerting and, and disappointing and, and, and a little bit even almost, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, offensive to some people. I'm sorry. That I know, I know, it's not offensive at all. I think it is something that we need to hear. And, I, and the reason I cut in certain areas is I, I want to place some of what you're saying into a perspective that folks can actually touch. When you talk about um, uh, it, it, the status quo, or when I mention the status quo and you talk about, I'll tell you what you want to hear, but I'll keep doing what we've always done. In as much as we got healthcare, the Affordable Care Act, which saved a lot of folks, no doubt about it, but the reality, it only saved a lot of folks by enriching the same folks that you that you're talking about the financiers the titans of finance that control this country so in as much as good was done for the average american citizen it was done at a cost and that cost was still the american people paying a lot more uh for not that much more to provide uh, a new cash flow or a, a new a new panacea for the um for the wealthy for the for the uh, titans of finance continue my friend well, let's let's leapfrog ahead uh, from 2008 to 2020, January 6, 2020. So we have this insurrection. We're uh, seeing foment from the right, uh, and anybody paying attention, both online, but particularly through Fox, was this 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 incredible PR press that there were questions regarding the election, the integrity of the election. And that was used to justify what became somewhat of a popular uprising, which to those of us paying attention at the time, were surprised to see thousands of people from all over the country descend upon Washington and then land in uh, Donald Trump's um, you know, Washington, D.C. hotel, for example. They were all online. But then, of course, I remember watching mainstream media at the time, particularly Rachel Maddow, and a lot of these folks uh, were acting as if nobody uh, really could see what, well, let me, let me 
I'm, I, I should probably do this in a chronological setting. But the first thing was that um, the uh, supporters of Trump and uh, protesters against potentially a stolen election uh, started to uh, congregate in Washington, D.C. from around the country. But those who were paying attention online could see a mile away that this was something that had been brewing, something being uh, discussed often and galvanizing out in the open. And so when you contrast that with ultimately what I was seeing in mainstream, where a lot of people were somewhat surprised the day of the actual insurrection is my point. So for example, we saw thousands and thousands of protesters. We saw Trump give the speech. Then we saw the protesters uh, you know, uh, uh, attack the Capitol and everything that came afterwards. And we all saw it with our real eyes. And we saw, I mean, it was like, it was extraordinary to see because I was like, First of all, after everything that the country had gone through, you know, the first questions that I was asking Egberto was given the layer, the levels of corruption that we knew existed, that the only people that were actually protesting our government were people that appeared to be far right lunatic French. <laughs> For me, I'm like, wait a second, the American people to redress their grievances would, would be manifested in what appears to be a kind of a confederacy, if you if you will. And then the whole things seem to be to be this dalliance of this sort of, I don't know, however you want to describe or interpret, you know, how we all have seen and known Donald Trump over the course of the last de several decades. But what I'm trying to get to uh, is, is, is really what I'm, uh, I, I've got to make this case to your audience and, and the American people writ large. So fast forward to 2023. So we've seen now North, well, 91 indictments of Donald Trump, right? Everything uh, ranging from, you know, the hush money payments with Alvin Bragg and and the uh, uh, um, and the you know the district attorney of New York, and then but but more importantly to to what I'm about to reveal to you, everything that has manifested has created this 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 framing, if you will. Uh, from the January 6th investigation in Congress last summer to now through Jack Smith's investigation and so forth, is that Donald Trump defrauded the United States. And then we're showing how all of the different ways that Donald Trump defrauded the United States. Now, he defrauded the United States, according to the government, of course, uh, with a racketeering conspiracy. Well, oh, that's interesting, is it not? So, Forever, mainstream media, and I've seen this, you know, to my wit's end, that for the most part, conspiracies have been downplayed because there's a lot of nutty conspiracies out there. And then if something especially gets framed by the professional class as a conspiracy theory, then, of course, it just automatically discounts uh, whomever is uh, purveying that sort of conspiracy theory. Now, we all understand, thanks to Fonnie Willis, that it's okay to declaratively in mainstream media specifically talk about conspiracies, because, of course, it takes a conspiracy to put together an event like um, stealing an election and creating a coup d'etat, which is exactly what the right did. And so from the position of, uh, well, I should say supporters of Trump and what we affectionately call MAGA, um, was the scenario we're now between Jack Smith and Fonnie Willis and, of course, Alvin Bragg. And then um, uh, soon to become, and this is going to be the most important and crucial information of all, particularly as it relates to our work, is going to be all of the uh, charges that are going to come uh, to Donald Trump's business practices over the course of decades that will come through the New York AG's office, most of which are involved with what we call control fraud. Now, I'll come back to that momentarily. But consider for a second again, what the case is, right? And in, in the way the government is framing this with all of these incredible resources for Donald Trump, which in context of what I'm about to reveal to you is of course one person, but his conspiracy is quite large as we all know. But the long and the short of it is the way he defrauded the United States incorporates a number of uh, initiatives. First and foremost, in what we saw this past week out of Michigan, for example, are felony charges against 16 uh, defendants based on what we call the fake elector scam. So these people with presumably, and what we're seeing come cross-reference from what uh, Rudolph Giuliani and a couple of other of Trump's attorneys were involved with, um, executing and um, being synergistic and um, you know designing, if you will, through this conspiracy, a full fake elector scam where people just basically created 
um, phony signatures on elector uh, certifications meant for the, you know, obviously the electoral college, going back to our original idea of what the founders do and don't do uh, in context of democracy versus minority rule, right? But that's another topic. But they, we know clearly that it's against the law and it's a felony and can be prosecuted with charges of, of over 20 years for lying on documentation fraud for something as significant, of course, as a presidential election. So that's one. Now, two, interestingly enough, out of the um, um, uh, Jack Smith's investigation about a month ago, he was um, very adamant. And this was huge news at the at the outset of this. But it's always in the back of what's going on with the special investigation by Jack Smith. As it turns out, and to a surprise to no one, but at the same time, it's great again to hear this from the DOJ, that Donald Trump's Trump's lawyers have been lying on his behalf. And Jack Smith has got him caught in a bunch of different lies as it relates to you know, the top clearance uh, information that was found at Mar-a-Lago and maybe some more apparently up in uh, Bedford uh Bedminster, sorry, uh, New Jersey, um, it is other golf club, top secret clearance information. You know, a lot of people are speculating maybe Donald Trump had potentially, you know, provided uh, top secret nuclear information, and nuclear plans, uh, you know, in a potential war with Iran to Saudi Arabia and everything that that constitutes, which interestingly, you know, obviously Jared Kushner and Steve Mnuchin have realized over six billion dollars from Saudi Arabia recently. But let's just put that on the side. But again, lawyers are being um, uh, uh, basically indicted by the Department of Justice for lying. Now, further to that, what we've seen recently, and I've been paying very, very, very close attention to this, is one of my favorite anal- uh, analysts on MSNBC is the University of Harvard professor Lawrence Tribe, who, among mm-hmm. others, one of his um, students, of course, is our Attorney General Merrick Garland, right? And this guy, when I hear him speak, he speaks with such clarity and dexterity in terms of what the law does and what it doesn't do. I feel like I learned so much when I see him appear a lot of times with Lawrence O'Donnell. And what he did recently was he made the case that uh, Judge Eileen Cannon, down in West Palm Beach, might be, just might be, uh, conflicted. Now, we all know that Donald Trump has uh, assigned a bunch of judges. This not just in, um, you know, in Judge Eileen Cannon's case, but also to appellate courts throughout the United States during his administration. And I think a lot of us are much more now aware of corruption in the um, Supreme Court via all of the information we've seen recently on uh, Clarence Thomas, of course, which is incredibly disconcerting. But of course, Judge Alito as well, welcome, I mean, accepting billionaire gifts and being on specific cases that have impact for their types, their, their businesses and so forth, direct corruption and pollution of the Supreme Court and all of that, that entails. But going back to Judge Eileen Cannon, what's very important to understand is that Lawrence Tribe on national television has impugned the integrity of the court of Judge Eileen Cannon. So put those three things aside for just a moment um, and, and, and understand that I'd say that, in fact, I don't want to speak for your audience. You tell me, Egberto, would you say that a majority of your audience that you interact with would be supportive of seeing Donald Trump convicted for these crimes and the others that appear to be um, you know, working their way through they the would. Of course they would. They, they would definitely why would want they to out of curiosity? Why would they? And they really think he's a bad person that has done all, that has committed all these crimes. But not only that, but the system is 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 ready. The system is not the system, part of the system, the I guess the the sort of middle of the system now sees him as a liability and they are willing to let him go. But the truth of the matter is, uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, there's a whole lot of bigger things to fry. So, I mean, we're spending a lot of time on this when there's a lot else going on. But well, continue. No, I'm going to bring that, but I, but I want to, I, I just want you to, you know, and I think you did, but I'm, I'm just going to ask you a follow-up question, if you don't mind. Um, you know, just in conversation that I have and, and things that I've seen, particularly in reaction to all of this information coming through the New York Times and the Washington Post and all things 24-7 of, of Donald Trump coverage, as well as those that respond in social media, particularly celebrities, it's like they've bought into this notion that our democracy lives or dies with the uh, conviction of Donald Trump, who we can see has been. Uh, 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 let, uh, OK, that let me tell you, first of all. And, and I, I if, if I understand where you're going with that, 
that is a very important thing that most Americans better realize right now. Donald Trump was not the problem. The system has always been the problem. J Donald Trump was just an inept person that came out and said out loud what everybody has been and continue to do behind the scenes. I, I, I want that, you know, and I, I speak about that on the show quite often. People sit down and think we're going to put all of the, that, the, the existential, that uh, getting, uh, getting rid of Donald Trump is existential to maintain our democracy. No, Donald, uh, Donald Trump has laid the foundation uh, in, in a voice, the foundation that makes minority rule and not only minority rule, but he has allowed the bad things to seem plausible. And that's the greatness of why, you know, so when when he's gone, what we have are more intelligent people capable of executing what he attempted to execute and failed. He says the quiet parts out loud because he's not the brightest bulb in the box. In addition exactly. to that. He's so he's so arrogant. He's so arrogant. You know, I use this as kind of a comedic sort of uh, you know antidote to the whole thing, and then I'll move on to the next point, which is exactly what you've you've telegraphed and inappropriately so. But I mean, in the case of the hush money payments to uh, uh, you know to a, a porn star, based on the statutes of dark money and Citizens United, all he had to do was hide that in LLCs through other players. Exactly. Not very smart, he is he? Had broken the law. He just, yes. he just he was so lazy that he went around the statute. We have we have Citizens United that would have protected. We have McCutcheon that would have. There are so many Supreme Court laws. All right, I mean, ju I mean results that would have aided him that he would have gotten away with just what uh the coke brothers or any other wealthy person gets away exactly with. or or potentially what we're talking about in the supreme court right but anyway it, 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 the, the perfect point but but you know i need to make this broader point because and, and, it, and it's and you're so exactly right egberto and i know you deal with this every single day because it's just like again it's just all this stuff reminds me of children's parables that we tell our kids when, you know, when they were first born. I mean, whether it was, you know, the emperor's new clothes or whether it was Humpty Dumpty. I mean, this whole fractured business of the country right now, will we be able to put the country back together depending on what happens with Donald Trump is a significant question. But it's ridiculous considering that Donald Trump is literally both a reflection. He's a mirror. He's a reflection and a refraction of everything we show you in our work the con that is our financial system got away with to the tune of tens of trillions that destroyed tens of millions. And let's make that connection now, because I think we we we, uh, we probably have about 12 minutes left. And I know you have to uh, build up that connection, because like we mentioned up in the beginning, uh, we are while we are we are thinking getting to Trump is going to solve the nation's problems like you're about to explain. Uh, he is just he is just the person that we can get rid of now because he's already cauterized the bad and he's made the bad plausible. Continue, my friend. I have to thank Donald Trump for just being this guy to basically show just so clearly exactly what we're in the midst of because he's just shoving it in everybody's face. Look, the bottom line is this, okay? In our work, The Con, again, that is available now for free at www.thecon.tv, what we had to do was we had to pull the strings on what our financial system actually is based on the 2008 great financial crisis. And what we discovered was there were literally, Egberto, it, this is not hyperbole. I know this number is going to sound crazy. I assure you it's accurate. And I, I, I not down to like, you know, within five, but it, it literally tens of millions of felonies were created in what we call liar's loans. Now, liar's loans is this approximation of using documentation fabrication because brokers were able to utilize methodologies because they knew the numbers and all of the different uh, you know uh, parameters that were um, uh, used to be able to get a, a, a loan approved 
they were incentivized by CEOs of this country because we have what's known as modern executive compensation, where after the Clinton administration, we got rid of most of the regulation that we put in play after the Great Depression to prevent all of this stuff from happening. But because we had the revolving door and there's outsized influence of our financial system and our legal system, and they got deeply involved with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. There's slight differences between the two of them, as we all know. But the bottom line is that deregulation enabled this monstrosity of people, and there was no regulation. So basically, we call it the three Ds. We call it deregulation, desupervision, but most importantly, decriminalization, because nobody's looking. So ultimately, We had tens of millions of uh, documentation fraud creating what we call liar's loans that were put into a system. And there's a there's a conveyor belt. Now, anybody who's bought um, real estate understands that, uh, you know, there's a process in play and there's also laws in play, you would think, to maintain the you know, the the, the credibility uh, and the value, if you will, of real estate, but it can all be manipulated. Now, Donald Trump comes from this background and has been doing this his whole career. I'll give you a couple of examples of that downstream, but going with what the government is, is, is uh, demonstrating what Donald Trump is guilty of now, Wall Street allowed these brokers to create tens of millions of illegal documentation based on just deceptive acts and practices. Again, going back to Donald Trump, He's defrauding the United States based on deception. Okay, that's a thing. By the way, we have remedy for that. And it's RICO, especially when you do it with a conspiracy. But moving forward. So as you move on the conveyor belt of liars loans through appraisals that were influenced to lie, to create hyper and valued, um, hyper valued uh, uh, assets for the rich, ultimately, that lenders provide top dollar because they're shuffling this through the deck. And then the other stopgap was, of course, the nature of um, uh, the uh, credit rating agencies, one of which is Moody's, which is owned by Warren Buffett. They were lying on their due diligence of underwriting, just like all of the underwriters in the system were lying, to approve, 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 and provide AAA stated, AAA rated um, uh, reviews of huge trusts and huge securities that were being unloaded on pensioners, countries, communities. Let, Go I, I, I want you to hold and hold your thought there because I want to explain something to the audience. Um, these guys gave all of this a semblance of legality. And when we talk about the rating agencies, what they did is they learned how they they, they supposedly had mathematicians who learned how to packetize bad debt with medium bad debt, with good debt and with best debt, and somehow turn the combination of those papers into a class A asset, which means an asset that is, uh, is, is of good risk. So they gave it the pl- a plausibility of being a good investment made of, to put it bluntly, doo-doo. Continue, my friend. Right. And there's a reason they did that. And it's in our show, The Con, but it's because CEOs can create the facade of short term growth that gives big returns to their, uh, you know, their investors and also the board, most importantly, because they're the ones getting a lion's share of the upside, all based on deceptive acts and practices, which, oh, by the way, as we're seeing demonstrated in um, the government's case against Donald Trump is illegal. But they did it in the tune of tens of millions. Now, to give you an example of how this whole thing worked, after you get past the rating agencies, it went into derivatives and what we have, all these different products, a great sort of primer on how this whole thing works. Many people saw the big short. That's like first base of what actually happened. And it's not anywhere close to what you see in our work. But ultimately, we had a $4.6 trillion housing market about this time period of 2005, 6, 7. That became a six hundred to eight hundred trillion dollar um, um, a, a global derivatives mass a mess, and ultimately all predicated on lies the whole time. It was inevitably going to blow up. It was all a facade, and it was all preventable because thousands of people tried to stop it. And all of that work, and then some, is in our work. But ultimately, bringing it back to Donald Trump, though, after the um, the, uh, the the rug fell, the, the rug pulled the the floor fell out the ceiling caved in all of the rest of it we had this mass global meltdown nobody had any idea what was going on 
we ended up calling it subprime. And then we started blaming, you know, uh, people that we claimed, you know, took out more than they can afford or they didn't know what they were doing. And in many cases, most people blamed minorities because it was like you shouldn't uh, be able to loan to minorities. And they were blaming at the time what was called the Community Reinvestment Act and all sorts of other things. I don't want to litigate all of that at the moment. I just want to stay uh, on path considering the time period here, comparing it to where we are with Donald Trump, because ultimately, after everything got destroyed and why we went to go make our work, you know, the Department of Justice under Barack Obama, led by another African-American who we all, I think, at the time celebrated as being the first African-American uh, you know, director of the uh, DOJ and the Americans in, in the history, instead of bringing the mass information that I now know existed beyond comprehension, that the media never delved into, and that was the reason we had to make our work to begin with, they never put the entirety of the, the, the puzzle together. The, Depart go the Department of Justice had all of this information, but instead of bringing all of the power and the might of the legal system apparatus of the United States to bring massive racketeering charges against racketeering enterprises, particularly through the Dons, not to be confused with Don the Con, but the Dons, the heads of Wall Street, the CEOs that were manifesting what we call a control fraud based on all of these elements that go into the pipeline, instead of bringing the RICO uh, statutes against them, what we did was we did deferred prosecution agreements. They didn't have to admit to anything. The investigations stopped. And ultimately, at that time period, the government did this incredible smoke and mirrors where they sold the world that we were going to spend $700 billion from Congress to save the financial economy of the world. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what we did was that was all just smoke and mirrors because the Federal Reserve behind the scenes decided to unleash at the time in 2009 29 trillion dollars trillion dollars yes 29 trillion dollars to these racketeering enterprises that blew up the world that were all provable that are all being demonstrated because they used and I'll finish with this real quick and then and then I'll answer your questions they among other things I demonstrated that there was millions upon millions of documentation fraud but ultimately what we find in the collapse of the 2008 great financial crisis we had millions of foreclosures well, you can't have uh, coal transmuted into gold and then transmuted into coal again. That's what they did in terms of the documentation fraud. So attorneys all across the country and what we call um, foreclosure mills working with this apparatus called servicers worked in concert to create liars fraud closures. So they created the same type of mechanical uh, lies to foreclose Online. the people on millions of people mm -hmm. that got completely set up and destroyed and had their houses taken and then the collateral damage that comes from there. And as it turns out, judges, and we're talking thousands of judges, were working in cahoots to ignore oh, all of the actual uh, information that they wouldn't allow what we call discovery, which is what you have to have to put all of these cases together. So. Instead of all of the uh, the law working in concert on behalf of the millions upon millions of people that um, got destroyed by the system, the law actually worked for the guys that did it, as did our financial system. So the 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 relevance would be okay. So guys who were all up in arms about as justifiably so Donald Trump getting away with murder, you know, of the American dream or you know law and order and all the rest of it. Just imagine. If knowing what you know now about all of his cumulative cases that you decided that we decided as a country, hey, look, no harm, no foul. Let's give Donald Trump a few billion dollars, maybe a few trillion, and let's just wipe everything plain and you know that'll be that. that'll be that. That would be the equivalent of what we did to Wall Street, and it's ridiculous. Well, I mean, it's interesting because what I wanted to bring up is that. Donald Trump has a point, and I, I hate to say this, but he has a point. The fact that he's, they are going to come after him for racketeering on the state level, the fact that they're going to come to him on all, the, on all these other charges that 
others have been a bit smarter in doing the same, meaning the bankers per se. Donald Trump does have a point. They are coming after him. But whatever happened to the others that they should have gone after? He probably well, he has two points, said, well, Alberto. Yeah. He, has two, he has two points. Go ahead. The fact of the matter is, in your demonstrative and in the appropriate way, considering mainstream media and also all the hate that we're seeing on social media and everything else, and that's another conversation for probably another day. But look, man, media is fake. <laughs> that's why we had to make the con because I knew, and there's so much more to it. Um, but I knew that some that, that you know something smelled wrong in Denmark. The cheese smelled wrong in Denmark. And once we started asking questions and we started getting to the right place, and you know, to let everybody know, I mean, I want you to think about this for a second, right? So Fox, you know, admitted under uh, subpoena through uh, through Rupert Murdoch that their entire platform is a lie. That they were their business model is a lie. That's why they ended up settling for seven hundred eighty-seven million in the Dominion lawsuit. Billion, now billion. They're now, now they're lying, you know, times ten. But just to put it into perspective, Fox, I think, had a three point seven billion dollar uh, profit in two thousand twenty-two. Right? I think they had fourteen point seven billion in operating. Yeah, that's, it's just the cost of doing business, my cost friend. Cost of doing business, right? And so the lies are now the commodity of the liars that are hiding all of these things from you. And so we, we literally put all this together to find the $29 trillion truth. And I want your audience to think about that in context to Trump, in context of the problems we have and everything else. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll finish with this real quick. Uh, Barack Obama and uh, President Biden and you know a litany of you know whatever we might call um, you know mainstream Democrats have justifiably recently celebrated what looks to be a lot of uh, sort of next level celebration by, by way of moving into renewable energy, for example. And a lot of this stuff has been coming from last year's, you know, um, uh, budget that came out of Congress that there was a lot of, you know, obviously the Republicans. The were IRA, trying to, it, it, yeah, it was like six point seven trillion. Then it went to one point seven trillion. We spent one point seven trillion to get what appears to be something to celebrate. Meanwhile, We've given at least north of fifty trillion to the financial system since two thousand nine. But, it, but it's worse than that because that one point seven trillion dollars is over ten years. We're right. talking about. Oh, right, uh, we're right. talking about uh, right. when they when they bailed out the banks on the order of twenty on, of twenty something trillion dollars. That was instantaneous. You know, uh, last week I was given uh, a lot of the subjects that I was covering was that Wall Street is a fraud. There is a man, I don't remember his name, who actually uh, talked about the 2008 crash and he betted against the market and made billions betting against the market in 2008. He's doing the same thing again right now. Michael Burry. Michael Burry. And 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 the funny thing about it That's is- a real big short just you now. Right. The, the fact that a person can just go ahead and make a bet on our economic system proves that the entire thing is fraudulent. Absolutely. It, you know, Absolutely. As, and uh, the, the way we met was from a statement Bernie Sanders made. Wall Street's business Wall model Street is fraud. It's fraud. And that's how we came together. And here we are closing with Donald Trump uh, getting caught up in RICO on a state level and in many other statutes on the federal level. When all the people that are much more damaging than Donald Trump, and by the way, we want Donald Trump convicted. Absolutely. Those that are convicted, don't don't think that we don't want Donald Trump convicted. This guy is evil, and we want Good him gone. forever. <laughs> but we also want the titans of finance who screwed, who caused the deaths of millions of, of thousands of Americans because they took their money, they conned them, as in what my brother here created in his series, the con. We want those taken care of. Give me a quick closer, uh, Patrick. I'm, I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I can. So I apologize to older listeners if I talk too fast on this. But thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and your audience. Once again, I really appreciate all that you do. Um, look, first and foremost, my friends, that a nation of, by, and for the people has to have, as everybody in mainstream media is talking about, no one above the law, not a former president, but not companies and CEOs either, especially those that do 
massive widespread carnage that continued to completely loot the full faith and the credit of the United States to basically lie and deceive everybody else instead of, of, of creating this identity politics war that is going to have catastrophic consequences and already has had enough consequences. My formula uh, is that corruption births and fuels fascism. And I'm trying to create a, uh, you know, a tidal wave populist crusade of those who care about liberty and justice to join and unite with the facts to be able to create a civil rights-like movement that purges corruption. Because if we don't, and we don't get our country up by and for the people back, we're doomed. Absolutely so. Uh, Patrick Laval, director, producer, and protagonist in the con. Uh, thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Thank you, as always. All the best to you and your uh, listeners. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.